can order all the living species in one tree of life, showing their evolutionary relationships. We don't know what the first living cells looked like, but the last common ancestor of all life gave rise to three big groups, the eukaryotes, archaea, and bacteria. Under an electron microscope, archaea and bacteria look similar, but gene sequences show that archaea are more closely related to eukaryotes. All eukaryotes have complex cells with a nucleus and organelles such as mitochondria. Most eukaryotes are fairly unknown single-celled organisms. We call those unicellular eukaryotes protists. There are three groups of eukaryotes that do have multicellular species, the plants, animals, and fungi. If we zoom in on the animals, we can once again divide them up into evolutionary groups. Firstly, the sponges branch off, then the jellyfish, those are the most basal groups. Then there are two big clusters, firstly the deuterosomes with chordates such as us and sea stars. Secondly, we have the proteostomes containing the mollusks, annelids such as earthworms, microscopic worms called nematodes, and the arthropods. All these very diverse living organisms have a few things in common, such as the fact that they are made out of cells. These cells have many different parts, but are all made out of molecules. And these molecules are made out of elements, to which we will now zoom in. The simplest element consists of a positively charged proton in the nucleus and a negatively charged electron in orbital shells around the nucleus. When there are two protons in the nucleus, there also have to be neutral neutrons to keep the nucleus together. With two electrons, the first shell is filled. A third electron will have to go to a second shell. All the other shells are filled with eight electrons in them. It is favourable for the elements to have filled outer shells, so if their outer shells aren't filled, the atoms will react. The elements are ordered in the periodic table according to the amounts of protons in their nucleus and the amount of electrons in their outer shells. They are ordered from left to right with increasing amount of protons in the nucleus in the period. The columns or groups consist of elements with the same amount of electrons in their outer shell. In this way, an element's column informs us about the element's reactivity. To illustrate this, let us zoom in on the left side of the periodic table, on the 17th group. All these elements have 8 electrons in their outer shell, but they want to have 8, so they react to make this happen. For example, the element bromine can react with another bromine to form dibromine. They then share 2 electrons so that they both have 8 electrons in their outer shell. So far, you've been given a representation of atoms consisting of a nucleus being orbited by electrons, a bit like a planetary system. In fact, this model is totally wrong. An electron is more correctly represented as things called orbitals, a cloud of probability, where the position of the electron could be at any point in this cloud, but the probability of this position varies according to the distance from the nucleus. The simplest orbital is an s orbital, which is spherically distributed in space. Others, such as p and d orbitals, have more complicated shapes. But how have we determined these shapes? This is where quantum mechanics comes in, which is the branch of physics that deals with nature at very small scales. The equation governing the shape of electron orbitals is the Schrödinger wave equation. Solving the wave equation gives us a wave function which, when squared, gives us the probability of finding a quantum mechanical particle. But why have we been using waves to describe electrons? Particles and waves are very different things. Particles occupy a definite position in space, whereas waves are spread out in space and behave according to very different principles, such as diffraction and interference. Something can be determined to be a wave or a particle with the double slit experiment. A source of particles fired randomly at two slits will produce two peaks on a screen, where the particles have accumulated, whereas a source of waves will interfere with itself as it passes through the slits, resulting in an interference pattern. What will happen when electrons are put through this experiment? If they really are particles, we would expect them to create the two peaks we have seen earlier, but surprisingly, they create an interference pattern. Does this mean that electrons are waves? An even stranger thing happens when we put a detector in front of one of the slits. In this case, we see a single peak on the screen. Does this mean that electrons are particles? In fact, they are both. A fundamental concept in quantum physics is wave-particle duality, which postulates that every object in the universe is both a particle and a wave at the same time. According to Richard Feynman, wave-particle duality is the central mystery of quantum mechanics, 